the Egyptians were in, or I'm sorry, the Israelites were in bondage for 430 years to the Egyptians. We found this in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, this whole experience. And God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they might come out from among you so that they might worship me. That was his purpose. I want them out of there so that they might worship me. It wasn't that I want them out of there so they're not living a misery life in Egypt any longer. It's not that I want them out of there to show the world how powerful I am. He said, I want them to come out of Egypt to a place that I'll direct them for the sole purposes of worshiping me. That was his whole motivation in bringing the people out of bondage. God's purpose in bringing us out of the bondage of sin and bringing us out of the bondage of darkness and bringing us out of the bondage of dead religion and self-works and uh, these kinds of things so that we can come into intimacy with him, so we can come into a place of worship with him. It isn't that God is demanding people to worship, that, he, you know, that he's some kind of an egotistical kind of a God that needs um, everybody's, um, you know, everybody to bow down and worship him. It's not that case at all, but we were created to be in fellowship with him, saints. The greatest thing we have, the greatest privilege we have is, as blood-washed believers is the ability to, to just come into his presence without any, anything that hinders us. You know, we could come into his presence. You know, how many of you enjoy the presence of God? You know, I mean, the presence, I mean, your presence is everything. What is there, what, what is there without it, you know? I mean, what is it without it? Moses said it in the wilderness. Lord, I don't want to go anywhere where your presence isn't. I want to be in your presence. That's where I want to be. You know, I don't care what it is, Lord. I just want to be in your presence, you know? When Jesus turned to Peter and he says, Peter, are you going to leave me as well? Jesus was preaching some hard stuff. It's like saying, you guys that are just here for the free lunch, you guys are here for the free fishes and loaves, and you're here for the bennies, you know, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not worthy of me. I'm, I'm talking about full commitment here. I'm talking about totally, totally being involved with me is what Jesus is talking about. The Bible says many of the disciples quit following, following him at that time. So he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, are you going to forsake me as well? Peter said, Lord, you are life. Where, there's nowhere to go, Lord. You are life. So, there, so, so we know when we have that realization in our lives, it is the most blessed pl place to be in our, in, in our existence. So we have the Israelites are in bondage. Moses tells, God tells Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that they come and worship me. We know the story, the ten plagues, all those things happen, the parting of the Red Sea. The, the Israelites come out onto the promised land. And God brings them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he offers, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, Mount Sinai, he offers the entire nation of Israel, probably about 800,000 adults, offers the entire nation of Israel, group of people, to become kings and priests unto me, to minister unto me, to worship me, and to minister on my behalf, to be my representatives, to be in intimate relationship with me, to be able to come into the holy place a presence that we see later on that only Aaron is able to go into as the high priest and the, the, the priests are. So he offers this priesthood to everybody and they deny it. So God changes it to the, from the nation of Israel to the household of Levi. And we have what's called the Levitical priesthood that occurs. And during this Levitical priesthood, we're gonna take a look at that, a couple of things this morning about the role of the priest in there. And I want you to keep this as we're looking at this I want you to recognize that this is your role as well. Because if you are a blood-bought believer and you know Jesus as your personal Savior, the Scripture says very plainly that we are kings and that we are priests. Kings have authorities. Priests have an anointing. So we're called to be intercessors. We're called to be not just... You know what? Being a Christian is not a uh, watching the Steelers on TV or in the stadium event. You know, you go to the stadium and you watch the Steelers and your presence has absolutely nothing to do with the outcome of the game. You know, you don't, you don't miss the game and say, dang, I know if I was at the stadium on Sunday, they would have won. Because I wasn't there, they didn't win. Nobody says that, right? You're just, pardon me? Yeah, some people say stupid stuff like, I forgot my lucky underwear. If I had my lucky underwear on, they would have won but it was in the dryer, you know, it was still wet or whatever. I didn't have my lucky underwear and they lost the game by three points. Every time I wear my lucky game underwear, they always win. So it's all my fault that they lost, right? You know, 
Yeah, I mean, you hear that stuff. I, did you ever hear any crazy stuff like it? I have as well, you know. It's just like, I asked them, have you, have you taken your meds this morning, you know? <laughs> Maybe you better call the doctor and get some adjustments on your psychotropic drugs you're taking here, you know, I don't know. The point is, is that you go to the Steeler game and it's like, rah, 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 you are what? What are you called? A spectator. But in Christianity, if you're a Christian, there is absolutely no spectatorship about Christianity, saints. You know, if you're just a spectator coming to church, sitting in the pews to be entertained or sitting in the pews and saying rah, rah, and clap, clap, and all that kind of stuff, and it wasn't that a great service today, and you go out of here and you're not playing the game, or what's the, what's the word, you know, fighting the good fight of faith, laying hold of the promises of God, then you've missed it. You're missing it. You're missing it. Okay, so as we look at this, you know, this is, put yourself in this place. When we talk about Aaron and his role, it's a type and a shadow of the role of the New Testament believer, of everybody. I don't care if you've been saved a week. I don't care if you've been saved longer than I've been alive. This is, uh, this is our, a, a place of privilege that every one of us can step into in this idea of prayer and of, of worship and of being in God's presence. Everybody's hand went up and said, you guys love the presence of God. And uh, so, you know, we have this. It's, it's not just for the joy of being in his presence that we, we, we experience his presence, but there's power in his presence. There's purpose in his presence. We need to carry out that power and purpose. We need to step into the role and the responsibility and the duty that is ours. We have a duty. You have a duty as a follower of Jesus. You're a soldier of the cross. There's a lot of militant words in there. Fight the good fight of faith. Endure hardship as a good soldier. You know, all these kinds of things. We, Paul uses this military. Uh, Jesus said, occupy until I come. It's a military term. You know, so so there's, this, there's this warrior kind of, uh, of position that we have and responsibility that each one of us has. Turn to Exodus chapter 30. This is, as God's laying out the role, uh, the, the role of Aaron as a priest, he's really giving us a glimpse into what our role is as New Testament priests, okay? There's a scripture in Hebrews that says that everything that happened to Israel is for our example that we might learn and grow thereby. So there's, so the things we see in the Old Testament, every time I go to the Old Testament and I read any of the stories of the Old Testament, I don't think, oh, that's just the Old Testament, I'm in the New Testament. I know Christians that say, I never read the Old Testament. Got the new one, what do you want the old one for? It's like, I never drive my old car, I got a new car. No, you're missing it, it's all God's word. Every bit of it's inspired from Genesis 1 to the very last words of, of revelations, it's that. And as we understand the new covenant, we go into the old covenant. When I read the old covenant before I understood the new covenant, man, it seemed to me like God was some mean dude, man. Just all he was doing was opening up the earth and swallowing people and bringing down judgment and all this kind of stuff. But it wasn't until I recognized the heart and character of God through the life and ministry of Jesus that I could begin to read the old covenant with that perspective and be able to understand and see, see God's purposes in that. And then looking, knowing what all of this is pointing to is a type in the shadows. Everything that's in the Old Testament is a type in the shadow pointing to Jesus. The entire Bible, Jesus is the center and the focus. Old Testament, New Testament, any book, minor prophet, major prophet, I don't care what it is. Jesus is the center. You can find Jesus. I heard, I heard a pastor at one time say that you can find, I can find Jesus in every chapter of every book of the Bible. I can point you to Jesus in that. I can tell you for sure, every book of the Bible clearly, if not every chapter, every book of the Bible clearly points to him. So let's look at Exodus 30. Uh, this is God giving instructions to Aaron as, as the high priest for Israel, his duties as the minister on God's behalf for God's people. Think about this, okay? This is Aaron's duty as God's minister on God's behalf for the people. We're going to read uh, verses uh, 1 through 8. So he says, Aaron, you shall make an altar to burn incense on, and you shall make it of acacia wood. A cubic shall be its length. A cubic is from the tip of your, look up here in just a second. The tip of your elbow to the tip of your longest finger is a cubic. It's about 18 inches. That's what a, a biblical measurement of a cubic is. A cubic shall be its length and a cubic its width. It shall be square, and two, cu two, two cubics shall be in height. So it's 36 inches high, 18 inches by 18 inches square. Its horns shall be of one piece with, with it, and you shall overlay its top, its sides, all around it, its horns with pure gold, 
and you shall make it, uh, make for it a molding of gold all around. So the whole thing's made out of wood and it's all covered in gold. Two gold rings shall you make for, the, for it under the moldings uh, on both sides of it, so you shall place them on two sides. So just real quick, here's the music stand. This is about this size. Here's this thing, rings on the side. It would slide poles in it. It was all gold. It's got to be heavy, made out of wood, covered with gold, so that they could carry it with, you know, with poles, slide poles in it, guy in the front, guy in the back, they could carry it. So that was what this altar was. And there was coals to be put on there. Now, this is not the altar for animal sacrifice. This isn't the altar for animal sacrifice. That was much larger, made out of stone. It was different. This was a piece of furniture that was going to be in the Holy of Holies, the place where God would meet with Aaron face to face and meet with Moses face to face. Verse 5, uh, you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay, overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testi testimony where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a, per a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So you're going to start doing this now, and you're going to continue to do this throughout generations, is what he's saying. So we have this incense. We have this altar of incense that is here. Coals are put on it. It's beside the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody see Indiana Jones, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know? You know, so there's, I mean, it, they had a box that was similar to size and all that. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And it's interesting, all this furniture, the Bible says that God showed uh, Moses the pattern of things in heaven. So this furniture is made from things that, that, that Moses saw in heaven, spiritual things in heaven. He's made these physical things to, sim to symbolize what, um, what's going on in heaven. So we have this Ark of the Covenant inside of the Ten Commandments. It's later it will become Aaron's rod that budded will be in there. There's showbread in there. Uh, there's manna that was collected from the wilderness experiences in there. And on top of it is a mercy seat with two golden cherubs with their wings over top of the seat that, it, that it's representing. That mercy seat is the representation of the seat that Jesus is sitting on at this very moment that is at the right hand of the Father. The scripture says when Jesus ascended unto heaven, he took his rightful place to the right of the Father where he's making intercession on your behalf. Jesus is praying for you at this very moment. At this very moment, he's interceding for you. And he's seated on this mercy seat where when his blood that he spilled out on the cross was sprinkled on that mercy seat, just as Aaron was to take a lamb without spot or wrinkle and take its blood and with his finger seven times sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Representation of Jesus' blood being poured out for us. The mercy of God that comes with the blood of Jesus. Night and day. In the morning, you put incense on there. In night, when you come and you light the lamps in there, you put some more incense on there. So we have this incense, morning prayer after evening prayer. Incense being placed continuously, perpetually, throughout all generations. Is what he's told to do. So we see this. You know, the Bible says for us to pray without ceasing. That word praying without ceasing, without ceasing, that word means without interruption or intermission. I love that, with intermission. You know, you go to the movie theater and you'll see a long movie. They give you a 15-minute intermission, you know. We had our, our men's uh, advance yesterday. We had three sessions. So we did a morning session, and I gave the guys a 10-minute break, 10-minute intercession to, you know, go have some, refill your coffee or eat the last of the donuts or whatever, and come back, you know. And then we came back, we got back into the Word again. So this idea is praying without ceasing, is that you're praying without any, without any intermission. You're praying without any breaks. You're praying without any interruptions of any kind. Does that mean you're on your knees, you have your hands raised, you have your eyes closed, and you're interceding? No. No, it's a verbal communication. It's a connection that you have. It's like thinking about Jesus as being a, your Siamese twin. You're connected at the hip, and you're there at all times. You're all constantly aware. You guys know my definition for uh, Galatians 5, 14 says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So what's my definition for walking in the Spirit? Anybody remember? 
constantly being conscious of his presence. So there's a constant consciousness that he's there. There's an awareness that is there. You're engaged in conversation. You know, it, you know it's, it's like when Kathy and I are together, we're engaged in conversation. You know, we, we go somewhere. I don't get in the car and drive home and say, oh, no, I forgot her. I left her back at Giant Eagle. I left her in Sam's Club or whatever and go back. No, I've never done that, right? I'm 43 years. I've never done that. <laughs> Did that to one of the kids? <laughs> yeah, like the Home Alone movie, right, where the kid gets left behind. So, so there's this awareness where you're, it's just a sense of saints. It's not like this dutiful thing of prayer. Sometimes prayer can be laborious. Sometimes prayer can be burdensome. But it's just this, this prayer is this, this being constantly conscious of his presence, being engaged in prayer, recognizing him, you know, entertaining his presence, entertaining his presence at all times. So we have this awesome privilege and this awesome ability, praying without ceasing, pay, praying uninterrupted continuously without an intermission. Now let's look and see uh, some more about this prayer. Let's look at Leviticus. I turn to Leviticus now. Leviticus, next chapter over, uh, chapter 16. Take a look at a few verses on there, just to expound on this a little bit more. This is not talking about the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is a yearly celebration. It's the most important of the Jewish feast days. It's a yearly celebration. It's the day that they go through the whole ceremony of getting the, their sins temporarily covered by the blood of animals and the sacrifice of an escape goat, this whole process. I'm not going to delve into any of that here this morning, but it's something that they recognize and they look forward to. It's a temporary uh, forgiveness of their sins for the year until the next, next thing comes. And it's all talking about, they talk about the lamb that is slaughtered, and Jesus identified, or I'm sorry, uh, John the Baptist identified Jesus as what? What did he call him when he first saw him? Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. So the Day of Atonement was a, a blood covering for a temporary covering for one year. When Jesus comes and covers you with his blood, man, it is done. It's gone. Taken out of the way. Nailed to the cross. We stand holy without spot and blemish before the Lord because of what Jesus has done. The record of our wrong has been sealed by the blood of Jesus. It's a document. Whenever they have uh, sealed records, you can't get them. You know, you can't get the record. You've seen, we've all seen the... the uh, the detective, crime detective movies and shows and all that. I can't get the records. I can't get the password. It's a sealed document. You know, the, those records are sealed. You know, I can't get in there. You know, it's that, it's that same kind of a thing. Happens as a result of that. Let's take a look at Le Leviticus 16, 1 through 14. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two sons of Aaron, and they offered profane fire before the Lord and cried. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban. He shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his, blood, wash his body in water and put them on. The scripture says that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're given a robe of righteousness. The scripture says that when we come to faith and as we continue in faith, that we're washed in the water of the word of God. So we see the symbolism here that's, that's coming on here as well. Verse 5, he shall take some of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, the one, uh, the one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which, he, which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as a sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a, a censer, verse 12, then he shall take a censer 
full of burning coals. The censer is simply, it's a, it's a handled thing. It's, it's covered with gold made from wood, and it's, it's a censer. Did you ever see the Olympic torch guys running with the torch and how they run, you know? When they open up the Olympic things, they run up the steps and run over and they put the thing in there. And supposedly that thing's been passed across the world or whatever. That's a censer. You know, it's got a censer with flames in it, just like a little, little thing. So he takes some of it, so he goes, to, he's telling him to go to the altar that has coals on it and incenses on it continuously. And that every, every morning fresh incense and coals is put on and every night fresh incense and coals is put on. Go to that altar, take some coals from that altar and put it into this handheld Sensor, handheld little altar, if you will. Sensor of altar, you guys with me? So he, so, so he has that, verse 12. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. So he's bringing, he has incense in one hand, he has the censer in the other hand. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. So he's coming before, the, he's petitioning for mercy from God. He's coming to God and asking him for mercy. He's coming, to, he's coming to God and he's bringing his request of mercy with his incense on this censer for himself and for all of Israel. And that recognizing this is just symbolic. This blood doesn't have any magic in it. This blood isn't doing anything here, man. This, I'm, I'm counting on the mercy of God. The Bible says we need to seek mercy. We need to pursue mercy. The mercy that we give is the mercy that we get. If we withhold mercy from others, then what? Judgment comes upon us. Verse 13, And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, but the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And he goes on with the scapegoat. So we're done with that. So we get this sense that, that he's doing this. You know, he's doing this thing on the Day of Atonement. Now, we continue through the, 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 the wilderness journey. We're getting close to the end of the journey now, 40 years. This next instant I want, to, I want us to look at, there's all kinds of things that go, go on in, in between there. I'm not going to mention any of them because that'll cause me to have a rabbit trail. But the, let me just read this. The partnering power and influence prayer has in this life is remarkable, saints. It's unbelievable. The opportunity that we have to represent God, just as Aaron had to represent God on behalf of, of, of that taking this incense and this prayer, covering the mercy seat of God with prayer. Jesus is sitting on the mercy seat, so we cover Jesus with our prayers on behalf of others. If you read the, the, old, the New Testament about prayer, you know, about the whole armor of God, take on Ephesians chapter 6, take on the whole armor of God, you might be able to stand, it was part of our lesson yesterday, men, you know, we might be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Go through the whole thing, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girded about with truth, your feet saw with preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of the faith, and the sword of the spirit. You might be able to fight against all the wiles, the fiery darts of the enemy. The next verse is this, and with all prayer and supplication for the saints. There's more verses in the New Testament about our responsibility to pray for others than there is for us to pray about our own things. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, the birds don't worry about what's going to be provided. The Lord provides for them. So what are you worried about? You know, I don't pray that God meets my provisions. I don't pray. I expect him to. He said he would in his word. I don't have to ask him to. But I recognize my responsibility to stand in the gap on the behalf of other, other individuals. How about this? The Lord said this in the Old Testament Chronicles. I sought for a man who would stand in the gap and make up the hedge that I might not bring judgment upon the city, but I found none. What does that mean? That means if, if you would have stood in the gap and prayed for your city, judgment wouldn't have come upon your city. America needs us, saints. Aliquippa needs us. Hopewell needs us. Beaver County needs us. Wherever you live, your neighborhood, your workplace, they need you. You can make a difference. You can make an eternal difference. You have the privilege and you have the responsibility 
to represent God in the sphere of influence that he's given you. In the work at workplace, the marketplace, the neighborhood, home front, here at Wildwood Chapel, you have a privilege, you have a calling, you have an enablement, you have an ability, you have an unction. The scripture says you have an unction, an anointing that comes from Holy Spirit. Every one of you here. I don't care if you don't feel it. I don't care if you've never had a Holy Ghost goose bump in your life. This is what God's word says. We walk by faith, not by sight, not by Holy Ghost goosebumps. They're nice. I like them. But I don't rely upon them. And I don't seek him to get them. If you're seeking him to get them, if you're seeking him to get a high, then it's, it's a counterfeit. It's a wrong motivation. It's a wrong heart. You know, man, I just love getting off on God. Glory to God. Well, it's, it's all about you, right? No, that ain't it. So ain't supposed to be all about you. It's supposed to be about him, you know. So let's see what happens next here. We're at the end of the journey. We're coming very close to the end of the journey. We've had all this stuff going on. Moses and Aaron have had to deal with a bunch of rebellion from the people. They get tired of eating manna. They want to go back to the, eat their leeks and the garlics and all these different kinds of things. So we come to this place where the sons of Korah rise up. The sons of Korah rise up and they said, we don't think we have to listen to you anymore, Moses. We don't recognize you as the God-ordained leader of us, nor the spiritual authority of Aaron. Therefore, we're going to get our own, our own scepters, and we're going, to put our, we're going to build our own altar, we're going to get our own coals, and we're going to do our own deal here. We're going to, we're going to do what God said only Aaron could do. So they usurped authority. They've gone against God's word. They rebelled against the Lord. And when Moses came to him and said, hey, what am I going to do with these sons of Korah? God says, they're not rebelling against you. They are, they're rebelling against you, but the heart isn't against you. The heart is against me. The sons of Korah have rebelled in their hearts against me. So what happens is, God says, next day, we're, um, we're gonna, God says, I'm going to straighten this out. So the next day, God proclaims to them, let me just take a real quick look and see how much of this is I have to set up and how much is there. This is number 16. Turn to number 16 if with me if you're there. If you're not there already. Did I say that? Number 16. It's confusing because we looked at Leviticus, Leviticus 16, number 16. So, okay. So God says, tomorrow I'm going to straighten this thing out. You know, get Aaron ready. You get ready. Tomorrow, God says, I'm going to straighten this thing out. So we have these sons of Korah that rebelled. There's 250 of them. With their, they're going to act like their own priests, not following God's protocol. God has a protocol, saints. We need to follow his protocol. You, know? you, don't, you don't just go to the White House and find a door open in the White House and go walking in and say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Who's Joe? What do you say? Mr. President. You, know, you don't say, hey, Joe, to Joe Biden. You say, Mr. President. There's a protocol you got to through, go through. When the president walks into the room, they say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. And what's the protocol? Every single person, you've got to be on your feet. You've got to be on your feet. If, if you ain't in a wheelchair, you better be on your feet. Because there's a protocol, to, protocol to, uh, to follow. So it's the same thing. God has this protocol that he has set up. It's a type and a shadow of what the New Testament priest is going to be like. He sets this up with Aaron, and these guys decide they're, going to do, they're, going to, they're, going to, they're not going to follow God's way. We're going to do it our own way. That's what religion does. Religion does their own way. You know, I, I've had people, oh, I know what the Bible says, but I feel like this, or, you know, we, my church says this. So I know the Bible says that, but our church says this. You're in a dangerous place, man. You better make sure everything you do lines up with the word, you know. Everything we do needs to line up with God's word. There needs to be some, some biblical precedent for what we do with our lives, you know. Biblical precedent says that marriage is between a husband and a wife, one man and one woman, not more than one man or one woman or people of the same sex. This is God's biblical precedence, you know. You know, the Bible says that if we, there's, there's so many things like that. We need to, society is now trying to shape the church where the church needs to be shaping society. And we'll see one of the ways we do that when we get to the end of this message. So let's look at this, what happens. The sons of Korah, have rebelled. <clears throat> They've risen up. God says, tomorrow I'm going to straighten this thing out. Verse 41 of Numbers chapter 16 on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. So what happens is, I'm sorry, right before this, I'm ahead of myself, I'm, this is next. What happens before this, what we're about to read is this. 
that God says, okay, I'm bringing judgment on the sons of Korah. And the earth opens up and all of the sons of Korah's families and their tents and their belongings all fall into the earth. After they fall into the earth, flame comes out of the earth and burns up and consumes all 250 of these guys that are faking it, carrying the censers and, and violating God. Pretty serious stuff, you know. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. Man, you better not be messing with him. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's going to be a burning that's going to take place, if not in this life, in the next life. We're living under the dispensation of, of grace. We're living under, we're living under the influence of, the, of, the, of what Jesus has provided for all of the world at this moment in time. We're living, the last 2,000 years of, of history has been for the purposes that God desires that all men everywhere would be saved. So we're under this period of time right now. That's why the wrath of God and the judgment of God is being withheld. But there's a time coming when the wrath of God is going to be released upon the earth. And final wrath and final outpouring of rebellion and sin is going to be, is going to be poured out. But I'm great for, grateful to God that we are just happen to be in the timeline of, of God's uh, interactions with humanity during this dispensation, this period of grace. So this happens. Now, you would think that would sober. Now, let me just ask you this something. If you're worth a million people and God was following, leading you around with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of smoke by day, you heard his audible voice, you ate manna, you saw miracles, all kind of, no one's shoes wore out, no one was sick, no one was diseased, and you've been doing this for all this time, okay? And then there's this little group, this rebellious group that rises up, this one household of Korah, and God judges them by opening up the earth, and they all fall at kids, women, children, tents, everything falls in there. Flame comes out of this, burns these 250 guys up. What would you do? Man, after I changed my pants, because they wet them, I'd be on my face begging for mercy, man. God, it's been in my heart. I almost, they almost convinced me to go get a censor and join them. Thank you, thank you, God, that I didn't. I mean, you should be in a state of humility, but what... It says that all of Israel rised up against him. All of, they were mad in Moses and Aaron for that happening. Now, tell me, does that make any sense? Like Moses and Aaron have some ability to split the earth, bring fire out? Do, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's ludicrous. This is God, man. This is a holy opportunity for repentance upon these people, and they're not taking it. So this is what happens. Verse 41 of number 16. Now we're ready to read that. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. How stupid. Now it happened, when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of the meeting, and suddenly the cloud appeared. So God shows up on the scene. God comes to the scene. He's there, presently on the scene. Suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. So the, Moses, when, the, when the, this tabernacle of meeting was in Moses' personal tent that was taken outside of the camp of the, all, the, all the nomadic people of all their tents. It's interesting, the way they even set up their tent was prophetic. They set up their tents in such a way, if you read about it, you, these, these uh, sons and daughters are to go to the north this way, these guys are to go to the south that way, these guys are to go to the west, and these guys and these guys are all supposed to go you know, to the south. From the aerial view, north, south, east, and west, aerial view, what is it? It's a giant cross of tents. If you, if you had a, a, a drone, what do you call them things? You know, a camera drone or whatever, and went over that, you would see this giant cross set up right there on the, on the, on the, on the field, which is a prophetic, their very existence is a prophetic uh, positioning of what, what Jesus is going to bring. So, so anyhow, so they go, go off to, so Aaron and Moses go over to the tabernacle of meeting. Now the tabernacle of meeting is also uh, the, the, the wilderness tabernacle that has the, the altar of incense we just talked about, uh, the mercy seat, you know, the, the, the laver, the um, menorahs, seven candlesticks with olive oil, all that furniture is there. So they're over there, they go over there and they're hanging out with God, or they go over to see what God wants. And God says to them, verse 45, verse 43, and Moses and Aaron uh, came before the tabernacle of meeting, verse 44, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying this, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And, they, and what did they do? Aaron and Moses, this is what they did, this is remarkable. 
tells you what their heart is, tells you what our heart. This so speaks to me that my heart needs to be the same kind of heart that they have, saints, and that every one of us need to have the same heart as Moses and Eric. They fall on the ground. They fall on the ground, and what are they doing on the ground? They're interceding. It doesn't say, it doesn't make any verses, it doesn't have any verbal communication here. There was another time, saints, very early on in the, in the, in the uh, wilderness experience, where God told Moses to step aside, I'm going to wipe out all these people because they're a stiff-necked, rebellious group of people, and from your descendants, from your children, I'm going to raise up a nation that will be uh, uh, my, my peculiar people. And Moses says this to God. He says, God, don't do this evil that you've purposed against the Egyptians or against your Israelites because the Egyptians and all the world will say that you are powerful enough to bring them out of bondage, but you are not powerful enough to lead them into the promised land. So for your name's sake, God, don't do this. And God's response was this. According to your words, I will not do this which I purposed against my people. According to your words. So Moses had such influence upon God that God was ready to wipe them all out early on, and now God's about to do it again. God says, Moses and Aaron, stand aside. This is it. It's been 40 years. I've been, I've been dealing with these stiff-necked, rebellious people. Their, their, their rebellion isn't just against you, but it's against me. I'm going to wipe them out. They fall down. Aaron and Moses immediately fall down in intercession. Look what Moses says next. next. Verse 46. So, uh, so Moses said to Aaron, take the censer and put fire in it from the altar. This whole, you know, the altar of incense that we talked about and showed you. From the altar, put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation to make atonement for them. For wrath has come out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had begun among the people. So, uh, so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living so that the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah, Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses in the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Wow. What would have happened if Aaron said, you know what, I'm about had it with these people too. I mean, don't you think God's justified in bringing judgment against all these sinful people, these rebellious, rebellious, rebellious people? God said, step aside. I'm, st I'm staying here. I'm stepping aside. I'm going to let this, I'm gonna, it's going to be, I got a good vantage point here. I'm going to check this thing out. Watch God go to work on these people. That wasn't his attitude at all. His attitude was, was immediately went to intercession. Immediately grabbed that censer and ran in the midst. He ran. God said, step aside. And Aaron said, I'm getting right in the middle of this thing. I'm going after this thing. I'm taking this censer full of incense, and I'm going to intercede on behalf of these people. I'm using the authority that God has given me as the, as the minister unto him and a minister for him unto the people. I'm taking this responsibility he's given me, and I'm asking for mercy. I do this every year. I've been doing this over and over again with the mercy seat and the blood and the scapegoat and all this kind of stuff to keep the people right with God, and I'm going to run in the midst of this plague. He didn't know if he was going to die or not going to die. Now, there's this plague, this death that's coming across the people, and apparently it must have started at one, one area and began, to, began, because when he got there, it stopped. It's kind of, I see it in my mind, a sense of, of the, the death is over here and people are dying and there's, you know, there's whatever, it's, it's got to be all kind of pandemonium, people screaming. Can you imagine watching people just dropping, you know, next to you dead? You'd be screaming, trying to run away from it. And he runs out in the middle of it with a censer, of in, censor, and he puts his incense on her and he's making intercession on behalf of this rebellious people. And the Bible says the moment he did that, what happened? The plague ceased. The plague ceased, saints. Turn with me to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter three. I think that's what I want. You getting this, saints? Is this man? This is just stirring my spirit. Like, 
how important is your prayers? How, how impactful are your prayers? If we have the same position and responsibility, not you know, position as ministers under the Lord and ministers for the Lord, we have influence on individuals. We have, our prayers matter. Our prayers matter hugely. I'm not, I didn't write down the right passage here. Let me find it real quick. What I'm looking for is it says that uh, in the book of Peter, in Peter it says, no, it's Timothy. That's what the problem is. Verse Timothy. I'm looking for the verse that says, um, first of all, that you would give prayer and supplication on behalf of all men, like those that are in authority over you. Here it is. First Timothy chapter 2. Sorry, guys, I had the wrong thing written in my notes. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, I exert, first of all, that supplications, that's, that is making petitions and prayers on the behalf of someone else. Prayers is general conversation with God. Intercession is standing in the gap doing spiritual warfare. And giving of thanks be made for who? All men. For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We need, our country needs us to pray for our leaders. Our country needs us. Whether you like the leader or don't like the leader, you need to pray for that leader. You need to pray for the Congress. You need to pray for the Supreme Court. You need to pray for our local leaders. You, know, you need to pray for, for the bombardment of the ungodliness that's coming upon our educational system right now. We need to pray for our school superintendents and our principals and our teachers. We need to stand in the gap and pray, saints. Why? Does it really matter? Let's see. Verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. That should be enough. That should be enough. You want to, be, you want to do something that's good and acceptable in the sight of Jesus? Do you? Question. Hands? Yeah. Then you need to be praying. For others, not just yourself. Praying for others. Verse 4. Why? Verse 3. For it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4. God desires that all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, are those two separate things? No, those are two things that are... It's the same conversation. It isn't like, okay, pray for this, and now we're going on to something else. No. As you pray for your leaders, as you pray for people... You are making the, you are opening up the heavens. You are pushing back the darkness. You are calling, you are, you are creating a spiritual atmosphere that's going to remove the veil of unbelief from the non-believers so that they might be able to have exercised their will and, and have a revelation, a spirit of revelation and knowledge and wisdom and come to the place of exercising the gift of faith that God has given every man that you might come to the place of surrendering their life to Jesus. Prayer makes a difference. There are people, you are, there are some of you sitting here today because you had a grandmother who day and night, night and day, prayed for you and interceded for you on your behalf. Some of you are here today because you had a praying spouse that prayed you into the kingdom, that loved you dearly and wanted to see you come into the kingdom. You know, I'm the man of God. I am standing here today because there are people that tell me, there are people that say things to me like, Pastor Rich, I pray for you and Kathy every day. And I can feel it when they say it. I know it's not just, you know, it's just not words, but it's real. Verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So, saints, we have the ability to change the atmosphere. We have the ability to make a, a, a spiritual impact on, the, uh, on others. Worship team, you guys want to come up here? Please keep, continue to give me your attention. Keep your Bibles open. I, wanna, I want them to get up here so we have a seamless, come on, guys, a, a seamless thing here. 
I want to show you one more thing in Revelations. Turn with me to Revelations. And I don't even have time to unpack all of this, but I think it's, it's vital that you get this to wrap up our, our, our thing. I'm, I'm, my hope is that I, I light a fire of passion under you to begin to pray, to recognize how important it is to pray. First Peter 3, 10 and 12, just listen to this for a minute. He who would love life and see good days, let him reframe his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from the evil and good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Listen to this, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are opened to their prayers. The ears are open, the eyes of the Lord are righteous and his ears are open to his prayer. So how valuable is prayer? to God. It's, I think the icing on the cake is found in Revelations chapter 5. Look at, uh, let me just, I have 14 verses to read, but I want to read all 14. Give me one second. Look at verse 8. Revelations 5, 8. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 12, uh, 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. So this is the end of time. This is, the, this is actually, it's very difficult to understand a lot of stuff in Revelation. Some of this is happening now. Some of it's going to happen in the future. Some of these visions and scenes that are in Revelations are actually transpiring at this very moment in time. Some, but then there's going to be like this physical thing that's going to happen in the, in the, at the end of the age when the, when the final judgment comes. So we see this, that there's, there's this whole, there's these harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Saints, Jesus has made you a king and has made you a priest. You have a priestly duty, a priestly privilege and a priestly responsibility to be in intercessory prayer for others day and night, putting your incense on there. It's so valuable to God that he saves them. We have them, the, the prayers of the saints are here found in bowls. Look at uh, Revelations chapter 8. We see it, what these prayers do again. This, this passage just lights me up. Revelations 8, 1 through 6. Now this is Jesus opening up the seals. Jesus opened this, the seventh seal. That was si There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to, to them were given seven trumpets. One another, one another the, then another angel having a golden censer, remember we just talked about with a censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the, all the saints upon the golden altar once it was before the throne. So this golden altar is the same golden altar that God told Moses to build uh, that it was after the pattern which is in heaven. So here, here we are back at this very opening scene of, the, of my message. Now we're at the, at the final scene of this golden altar thing. Verse four, and the smoke of the incense, which with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Saints, God has our prayers. Every prayer, the effectual, fervent prayers of righteous people avail much. It avails much, it accomplishes much, saints. Don't ever for a minute think that your prayers are ineffective. Don't you ever think for a minute 
that why pray? You know, there's theology out there that God just does whatever he wants to do when he, when he wants to do it, and we don't have anything to do. We just kind of go along for the ride. We are intricately involved in this thing, just as Aaron was intricately involved in stopping the judgment of God against those rebellious people. Don't ever give up praying for your rebellious children, your rebellious people that you love, uh, you know, people that are, people that are, are backslidden or whatever the case is, is, is. As you're praying, it's having effect at this very moment. It's being saved and vows it's going to be put on altar it is a sweet smelling your prayers are sweet smelling incense to god saints when you bring those prayers and requests to him uh, whenever we pray according to his will and according to his word because he desires that all men everywhere might be saved let's all stand